on This Week in Enterprise Technology, BYOD, Reaches, Net Neutrality, and Schmookon. Twyatt on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Enterprise Tech is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twyatt. This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 128, recorded February 9th, 2015. Schmookon and BYOD. This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by lynda.com. Lynda.com offers thousands of online video courses to help you, your team, or your entire organization learn the latest software, creative, and business skills. To learn more about lynda.com solutions for your school, business, or government agency, visit lynda.com slash twyatt. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash T-W-I-E-T. And by Ring Central, the business phone system that's in the cloud. Ring Central now integrates with Google for Work. Try Ring Central with a 30-day risk-free trial. Visit ringcentral.com or call 800-543-9980 and use the promo code TWIT. And by ldproducts.com, the ink and toner experts. Shop online at ldproducts.com for high-quality products at discount prices. For 10% off ink and toner cartridges plus free shipping, excluding OEM, Go to ldproducts.com slash twit and enter the offer code twit. Welcome to Twyatt This Week in Enterprise Tech. It's the show dedicated to the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and the geek who just wants to know how the world is connected. I'm your host, Father Robert Ballas, the digital Jesuit, your guide to all things in the enterprise. And today, it's just me... And Cheever, Cheever, Brian Chee, the director of the Advanced Network Computing Laboratory in Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh, Brian, you were having some power problems this morning. Yeah, we had some pretty high winds, and I woke up in the dark this morning, and the wife said we just got power back about an hour ago. So that was kind of fun. Uh, are, we, are we worried about you losing power in the lab? <coughs> no, nah, it should be okay. So every once in a while, I'm probably going to Cylon a little bit. Uh, we are apparently getting some people deciding they don't like us and they're attacking us again. Oh, that happened. You know what? When they attack you, you know you've made it. Well, let's go ahead and jump straight into the blips. Curtis Franklin is away on business today. But uh, let's go ahead and start off with some Title II. Last week, FCC Chairman Tom Wheeler announced that he is proposing the use of Title II to enforce strong net neutrality regulations. There was a chance for earnest debate about the balance between regulation and laissez-faire business practices, but Comcast fired back just hours after the announcement with an advertising campaign that, among other things, says that Title II will raise your taxes by $72, take away Pandora, make you lose your wireless service, and lead to communism. No, seriously, that's exactly what it says. There are plenty of good arguments that we need to consume to be fully informed about net neutrality, but regurgitated PR FUD should not be on the menu. Well, sour grapes are on the vine as lobbies complain that the White House had undue influence over the FCC on net neutrality. The Republicans are crying foul that President Obama applied undue pressure on the FCC on the subject of net neutrality. Funny how the person driving this witch hunt, Jason Chavez, a Republican from Utah, seems to have some pretty big donors in the industry, including Comcast. Unfortunately, I seriously doubt the debate is over on net neutrality, and I would strongly encourage the Twyatt riot to write to their congressional delegation and keep up the pressure to support the FCC on net neutrality. Ding dong, Windows RT is dead. Probably. And like that, Windows RT is gone. Last week, Microsoft confirmed that the Nokia Lumia 2520, a 10.1-inch quad-core ARM-powered Windows RT tablet, will end its production run. As all of Microsoft partners have now walked away from the RT platform, this essentially kills RT. This doesn't preclude the possibility that Red Redmond will make an ARM-based tablet in the future, but RT faithful should probably count on this being the last gasp of Microsoft's biggest mistake ever. Which is a real bummer because I've got some RT tablets. Anyway, 
Washington state lawmakers want computer programming languages to count as a foreign language. Really? Washington state is joining Kentucky as lawmakers try to make programming languages count like natural languages for in-state college admissions requirements. Oh, come on, get real. One of the big reasons why natural languages are so important is that it gives students a view in a different, into a different culture. Are we going back to isolationism? Really? I'm a computer scientist and quite a few programming languages under my belt. But I also have a couple natural languages under my belt, and those human languages sure help me understand other cultures. Sorry, folks. This is something voters need to tell their lawmakers that they're just contributing to the dumbing of America. 20 miles east of Mesa, Arizona, there's a facility that was once the factory where GT Advanced Technologies manufactured scratch-resistant sapphire for Apple's iPhone. GT is long gone, driven into bankruptcy by construction delays, power outages, and more than a little misunderstanding between them and Apple. But now Apple, which actually owns the 1.3 million square foot, $250 million building, is turning sapphire lemons into data center lemonade. Apple will be investing $2 billion over the next 30 years to turn the facility into the command center to control all of the company's server farms. The Apple Corps will employ 150 employees and will have its power needs served by a soon-to-be-built 70-megawatt solar farm adjacent to the facility. Construction will begin in 2016, and Apple declined a $10 million grant to locate the facility in Arizona, so go Apple. Uh, when we come back, we're going to be diving into net neutrality and a little bit of breach news. But first, let's go ahead and take a break to thank the first sponsor of the Twilight Riot, and it's got to be Linda. Now, when you think of knowledge on the Internet, I hope by now you think of Linda. They are the repository for everything you may need to develop yourself or your business skills. Now, if you're a fan of the Twit TV network, you've seen us advertise them on all of our shows, basically, because they delve into business, they delve into programming, they delve into DIY makerspace and just good old-fashioned computer skills. But did you know that Lynda.com also offers multi-user solutions to help schools, businesses, and government agencies? With Lynda.com, you can train your team, department, or entire organization, including all of your employees, your students, faculty, and staff on demand 24-7. Lynda.com integrates with your network for simple access and administration, allowing you to provide users with Lynda.com course content through your learning management system. Now, IT departments can use Lynda to provide a virtual help desk to reduce support calls, assist with upgrades and migrations, whether your team is upgrading to the latest version of Windows or Microsoft Office, or migrating to new applications. It can keep your organization up to date with the latest software and technology skills, like how to use SharePoint, or Google Apps. In other words, Lynda.com is like having your own specialized teaching force in your enterprise. Finance, coding, web design, Photoshop, negotiation, Excel, productivity tips, SEO, and so much more. Lynda.com has video courses for every department in your company. Now, for the Twilight Riot, there are also courses on everything from data science and business intelligence to network administration and enterprise content management. We use lynda.com at the Twit Brick House as a go-to reference for our entire team. In fact, right now our editors are using it to switch from Final Cut Pro on the Mac to Adobe Premiere Pro on the PC. It's how we learn. It's how we go. Now, here's what we want you to do. We want you to learn more about lynda.com solutions for your school, business, or government agency. Visit lynda.com slash twiet. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash twiet to request more information. And we thank Linda for their support of this week in Enterprise Tech. Chebert, here we are again, talking about net neutrality. All right, we got that out of the way. Now, I want to do a little something, something here. I, I want to reset because so much of the conversation around net neutrality has been vitriolic. It's been sound bites. It's been a lot of anger that has spilled out over 30, 40, 50, 60 years of pent up frustration with either how the government works or how the telcos work. Can, can we do that? Can we, can we have an honest discussion about what this new decision actually means? Maybe. <laughs> A good answer, good answer. All right, let's start off with some of the basics. Let's go right back down to the foundation. So we know that last week, FCC Chairman Tom Wheeler announced that he would ask his colleagues to protect net neutrality through the reclassification of broadband as a telecommunication service. 
He's been hinting at this for a while. At one point, he was proposing a hybrid version of Title II, but now this is the nuclear Title II option. Now, there's going to be some people who confuse Title II, so let's, let's actually explain what that means and where it comes from. Back in 1996, the, Te the Telecommunications Act allowed the FCC to classify ISPs as either a telecom or an information service. Now, telecoms are common carriers, like AT&T. They have to provide that backbone. They're bound by regulations, and the FCC has a lot of power over how they conduct their business. They only transmit and receive data. An information service, on the other hand, was a organization, a service that provided data and services. Now, the ISPs lobbied to be classified as information services, and in 2002, the FCC agreed with them, and they were classified as information services. The problem was that all these years later, 15 years later, we are now in a place where the FCC wants to organize ISPs, wants to regulate ISPs to make them more friendly to consumers, and they can't do it because of that 1996 decision. That's essentially what the invocation of Title II does. It reverses the 1996 decision and says the telecoms and the ISPs are now both telecom services. Chebert, did, did I miss anything? I mean, that's essentially what this comes down to, right? I mean, all the bluster, all the rhetoric going back and forth, this is saying if you run an ISP, you're now a common carrier. You bet. And the, the reality is, is what the hopes are is that now that if they want to keep their old status, shall we say, they're going to have to increase the amount of services. You can't just say I'm a dumb pipe and call it done. Now, one of the things that I'm really hoping for is I've actually gone through the AT&T school. In order to work in an AT&T switching center, you have to go through a set of classes and you have to do it annually. So one of the things they, they strongly stress in all their classes is all the procedures, all the checklists that you have to do, all the different things that you have to do as a carrier in order to get to the five nines of reliability. I've worked in a lot of different ISPs, doesn't exist. So on one hand, I think this type of thing might force the ISPs to be a lot more serious about striving for the five nines of reliability. And if you flip the coin over, I'm also hoping in order for these ISPs to keep their less regulated status, that they're going to jump on the boat with things like managed desktops, more cloud computing, uh, all the things that they really ought to be going into anyway. Um, and if they do, then maybe we're going to have services. So if you want to keep ISPs, if you want to keep your old status, start getting some of these um, projects off the back burner and actually bring them out to the market. Right. Achiever, I, again, I want to back off. I want to reset on this because it's too easy to fall into, oh, those evil, evil corporations or that stupid government because everything that the government touches turns to crap. Let's not do that. Let's back off and actually take a look at what each side is saying. And let's, let's get past the rhetoric and past the anger and, and take an, a balanced approach. First of all, let's take the side of, of the people, the side of the government. So what we're looking at is we're looking at a trend over the last 20, 30 years in which ISPs have, have, have become more conglomerated, have become more powerful, and have been increasingly effective at blocking out any new competition, which essentially gives us one choice for broadband no matter where we are. Now, I know there's a lot of people who are saying, well, but there's DSL and cable. Remember, Congress actually just redefined what broadband means, and, and most DSL no longer qualifies as broadband. So under the new <laughs> definition, most of us don't have access to more than one broadband provider no matter where we live in the United States. Okay, so on that side, we're saying we want you to take more seriously the promises that you made to the American people when you said, we will put our networks for the common good. We heard that from Comcast when they were building out back in 96. We heard that from Comcast when they purchased NBC. We've heard that from Time Warner when they were expanding into markets that were not served by Comcast. Now let's go from the corporate side. The, the, the number one battle cry of the telcos and of the ISPs has been, if you do this, if you use Title II, if you regulate the market, 
You will kill all investment because none of us will want to spend the billions of dollars we will need to spend in order to build out a network that we cannot make profit on. Does, does that, I mean, that's not, of course, the whole thing, but Cheaper, can you think of anything else we need to add on to that? Well, those are the two sides of the coin. And the reality, you know, it's not cut and dry. This is not a black and white argument. There's lots and lots of shades of gray. Even that uh, FUD video that you started off with is true in a certain way. You know, the free streaming, you know, video, well, streaming audio, Pandora and so forth on T-Mobile is a pretty good example of something that's going to go away. You know, th that's unfortunate. So all these sweetheart deals, um, a lot of them are going to get re-examined and people are going to have to decide, you know, the carriers are going to have to decide whether or not that is part of making it better. The interpretation of Title II is going to be really interesting. And I think that's where the FCC might have some wiggle room. It all depends on the exact wording that the FCC actually uses. Right. Now from, yeah, and from the end user standpoint, yeah, sure, you're going to lose some of the freebies, but do you care? Are you going to care? Because in theory, you're going to get more reliable um, services and in theory, faster services because of the reclassification of what broadband really is. Right. Cheever, let, let's take a look at best case, worst case scenario. So with the invocation of Title II, and remember, even though every ISP and telco is going to sue the FCC as much as they possibly can, the FCC now has a $20 billion war chest from the sale of Spectrum, the, the $47 billion that they took in. $20 billion of that has been set aside for unknown purposes. That's, this is probably where it's going to go. So let's say Title II does get pushed through. In your mind, what would be the best case scenario for the consumer? And it doesn't mean that, okay, we beat down the corporations. It could mean they see Title II going through, they change their ways. What, in your mind, would be the best outcome? I think the realistic outcome is I think the um, broadband is going to get a little more expensive. I'm not sure how much more. Uh, but I think the speed is going to go up. And if you're going to be playing common carrier, that means the reliability um, is going to be part of being a carrier. You know, AT&T, um, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, Ma Bell set the standards for what a carrier can provide. And just going through the education that I've gone through with the AT&T um, shop, there's a lot of procedures to make sure that we don't have something silly like some um, technician accidentally pulling a cable and then putting it back into the wrong outlet. Uh, so there's a lot of procedures to prevent outages and there's a lot of procedures set up in order to achieve that five nines of reliability. I think that's going to become part and parcel with what a carrier needs to be. And I think a lot of the smaller ISPs are going to have to step up to the plate. Okay, so that's, that's, uh, that's actually a pretty decent scenario. Uh, and, and that actually is a compromise. That's not one side winning entirely. That's that's both sides saying, okay, these are the new realities. These are the new the new laws. How do we provide better service while at the same time making sure that we can generate some profit? Let's go the other way. What's the worst case scenario that you see of Title II being implemented? Well, I think the worst case is actually we're going to see a bunch of small ISPs um, go bankrupt because uh, they can't afford to hire the amount of people necessary to maintain, you know, five nines of reliability. Uh, I think we're going to have a lot of um, ISPs saying, you know, we're going to give you up to a certain amount, but I don't think they're going to have any kind of rules saying that there's going to be a minimum speed. So I think there's going to be some ISPs that are going to have this backlash and they're not going to provision a whole bunch of pipes. So that means you're going to have more and more ISPs saying, I'm sorry, because of Title II, we're not going to invest in a bigger pipe to your neighborhood. You're just going to have to suck it up. You have a maximum of 50 meg or 25 meg down, but I'm sorry, you're sharing that with the entire neighborhood and we're not going to slice up the collision domain anymore so that you can get better speeds. I think that's going to be a backlash. I don't think it's going to last but I think we're going to have some backlash from the ISPs, basically sour grapes. 
right? Cheaper, one, one of the, uh, the sort of silent issues, it has not been talked about a whole lot, is that in enacting Title II, it could actually roll back one of the biggest contentious issues that we've had in the last decade, and that is how some of these Tier 1 slash Tier 2 ISPs have become content providers. And specifically, I'm thinking of Comcast. Allowing Comcast to buy NBC turned them into a vertical company where they were both the gatekeepers of bandwidth and a competitor with every other content provider. It would seem to me that if we went to a Title II system, something would have to happen with Comcast NBC. Because if you're now a common carrier and you can no longer give your own content any preferential uh, of space through your network, that it would almost preclude you from owning content. Yeah, almost. Or we might start seeing some splitting up, you know, some breaking up of a uh, Comcast or whatever. Time Warner, um, Oceanic Cable Vision in Honolulu is a pretty good example. Um, they are at their base an entertainment company. They are not a carrier, or that's what they always keep telling us. So they have artificially, or they say artificially made the um, network connection less expensive so that they can improve their content delivery. Uh, will this keep going? I don't know. Will it have to break up into a separate piece? Maybe. Um, I think one of the other things we might see is, remember, Title II is for carriers. What hap how is the FCC going to classify a content delivery system where you are providing services? Um, and, oh, by the way, in order to get those services to you, we have, a, we have a transport. By the new FCC ruling, does that make you a carrier or does that make you a true ISP? I don't think I've seen any real clear-cut definition of what a, a content provider really is and what the new regulations are going to be for that. Unfortunately, time will tell. Time indeed. Let's go ahead and move off. We're going to have plenty of time to talk about net neutrality as this develops because we want to still hear from the FCC what they mean by Title II. It's one thing for them to say, we're going to, we're going to vote on this. It's another thing for them to say, what will we try to regulate if we can get Title II to be applied? Now let's go ahead and move on to the next story. This one, this one kind of blew up. This was kind of big. It's the Anthem breach. So here's what we know. On February 4th, up to 80 million customers of Anthem, the largest for-profit managed healthcare associate of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield network, had their data compromised in what Anthem is calling a sophisticated cyber attack. Now that data breach reached across multiple Anthem brands, including Anthem Blue Cross, Anthem Blue Cross and Blue Shield, Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Georgia, Empire Blue Cross and Blue Shield, Amerigroup, CareMore, Unicare, HealthLink, and DCare. Now, they say that the breach was able to get a hold of names, health IDs, social security numbers, birth dates, addresses, phone numbers, email addresses, employment information, and income data. However, they don't think, at least there's no evidence yet to support, that the hackers were able to get credit card or medical information. Uh, some have suggested that the Chinese government was behind the hack, but that always happens when, when you start looking at uh, uh, the early days of forensics. But Chibert, this is an interesting case. This is something that that we actually predicted in last year's predictions uh, episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech. We all thought that within the year there was going to be a major breach of a healthcare company. We knew it would happen for financial companies, but a healthcare company was something that was it hadn't really happened yet. And this one is ridiculously large. Does this fulfill our, our prophecy? Oh, in spades. And it also, we, we alluded to it that too many people are still playing the perimeter game. Um, I'm from what I've been able to read, Anthem was still more of a traditional perimeter security type arrangement, and the fact that a lot of their data wasn't encrypted is raising some eyebrows, right. and especially something this kind, you know, this kind of privacy issue. Yeah, that that's actually something that we're seeing more and more, which is. Whenever you have a company like Sony that just counts on stopping the bad guys at the perimeter of the network, that means they're going to be very lax on security inside of the network. And it looks like that's what happened to Anthem. Uh, well, interesting enough, 
Obama is trying to propose that 30-day disclosure rule that any organization that has a breach of customer information needs to disclose to those customers within 30 days that there has been a breach. Anthem would have met that in spades. They, they reply almost immediately when they knew that there was a breach, they went public. So in that sense, this is good, right? We talked about this when we went to Black Hat and DEF CON yeah, this no. year, Chievert, that we, don't, we want zero transparent failure. This was a transparent failure, right? Or zero, we yeah. want 100% transparent failure. Yeah, you know, this is good. Fess up. Um, work with the experts to fix this. Uh, we shall see. Um, I'm nervous about it because I am a Blue, Blue Cross, Blue Shield um, customer. Uh, I don't think I'm an Anthem customer, but, it, you know, this type of breach does make me nervous. And I'm sure as heck hoping my healthcare carrier um, is taking a lot hard, you know, good hard look at this and try to make sure that they don't suffer the same kind of consequences. Especially since this is a information thief, an identity thief's treasure trove. They, they were very quick to point out that they don't think that credit card or medical information was taken. But when you look at what they have verified was taken, address, social security numbers, birth dates, phone numbers, emails, employment information, and income data, an 80 million person list is now, if you're an identity thief, that's the holy grail. That's, that's everything. That's all you're going to need because you now know which accounts you should go after and you know exactly the kind of information you need to forge an ID. Yeah, you've got more than enough to apply for new credit cards. Um, my suggestion to Anthem is see what kind of deal you can make with a company like LifeLock yep. and just offer it to all your members. I think that's about the only thing they can do at this moment. Right. Last year... We were talking about the change over to chip and pin, and I believe it was Oliver who was supposed to be on today's episode. So it's kind of a bummer he's not here because I, I would have loved to have gotten his input on this. He said very astutely that it would take financial pain before retailers would move over to chip and pin, and that's what happened with Home Depot, with Target, with all those breaches. Finally, the financial pain was enough to make them say, "We got to move over. Let's let's make the investment." We'll take the hit, but this means that we're going to stem losses in the future. He was absolutely right. Until these companies feel the financial pain, there is no incentive for them to make that investment. The problem here, Chiebert, is that Anthem is going to get fined $1.5 million. And that's it. That's the full extent of the law. That's all they can be fined, which is not, that's not even a slap on the wrist. That's the change that they have left in the couch. So, Where's the financial pain? Is there going to be financial pain? Because people who have insurance with them, there's not a whole lot of other options. Insurance is one of these things where nobody ever wants to switch. No, I, I think the, about the only thing we can hope for is a class action suit. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the laws don't allow for more pain. And you know, I should point out, you know, as much as we love chip and pin, chip and pin would have done nothing for this breach. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, and that's kind of sad, but a lot of the solutions that we talk about are very specific to that industry. And the more that we talk about security, the more we realize there there is no magic bullet. Yeah, you know, it'd be great if we had, well, like the Department of Defense, they have a thing called a CAC card, which has got a um, chip on it. So the chip of chip and pin. Now, the interesting thing is you can get access to all kinds of data on Department of Defense employees, but... Unless the employee goes and, you know, runs the CAC card and gives you permission, gives you kind of a token in order to get to that information, um, you don't have the need to know, so to speak. So it's a compartmentalization of personnel information, which is really cool. Um, such technology has existed for a very, very long time for the health industry. Uh, Fujitsu Corporation actually has handprint readers. <clears throat> that they were showing off at CES about five years ago, I think. And they had actually done that in Japan for healthcare so that the healthcare provider can't actually get to your information. They can store it, they can do things with it, but the sensitive stuff cannot be gotten to unless someone goes and sticks their handprint on there and releases the information for that doctor's office. Um, I. I hate to say it, but I think that's what we're going to start having to do. I think we're going to have to start having things like biometrics, um, chip readers, and things like that so that 
we can release one-time tokens to our healthcare providers to get access to our data. But unless we've given explicit permission, no touchy. I think you're right, Hubert. I think the days of sensitive data in the clear are over. Now, we will be bringing in a guest in the next segment to talk a little bit about those long days of security, encryption, and such. Miss Lisa Lorenzen from Pulse Secure, she's the Principal Solutions Architect, will be coming on to talk all about ShmooCon. But before we do that, let's go ahead and take another break to talk about the second sponsor of this episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and it's Ring Central. Now, Ring Central brings all of your phone system functions together in the cloud. Voice, fax, text, conference, high def video, no matter what you need, we love doing things in the cloud, and that's why we love doing things with Ring Central. A Ring Central does all the things that I need to have done out of a communications package. It integrates with both iOS and Android devices so your team can stay connected from anywhere, no matter what device they're using. It lets you keep your existing numbers or use toll free numbers, local extensions, and even vanity numbers so that someone calling from the outside sees you as a professional business, not just a bunch of people with cell phones. You can easily customize your system from a web browser on, on their mobile app so it works the way that you want it to work rather than you working the way that the phone system wants you to work. And if you're worried about privacy, and who isn't these days, don't. Your calls are encrypted and private with secure voice. Now, Ring Central just announced Ring Central for Google. That means you can now integrate your company's Google for Work accounts with Ring Central into one seamless communication hub. With Ring Central for Google, your staff can use the dial pad on your screen to make calls from your Gmail account. You can click any number on the screen in Gmail, contacts, or calendar to place your call, just like you would on your smartphone. And you can listen to voicemails directly with Gmail. Plus, you get faxing from Google Drive, viewing text messages, scheduling conference calls, and so much more. Customer support with Ring Central is always free and 24-7, and there are no setup fees or activation costs. A Ring Central starts at under $25 per month per user, and you can start right now with a 30-day risk-free trial. Plus, here's a special offer for my listeners. For every desk phone you buy, you get a second phone free, up to 20 phones. Visit ringcentral.com or call 800-543-9980. That's 800 800- 543-9980 and use the promo code TWIT. Ring Central. Get connected now. And we thank Ring Central for their support of this week in Enterprise Tech. This is my favorite part of the show where we get to bring experts on to talk about what's going on in the world of Enterprise Tech. And it is my honor, my privilege to welcome the Principal Solutions Architect from Pulse Secure, Ms. Lisa Lorenzen. Lisa, thank you very much for coming on to the show. Thanks for inviting me, Padre. Uh, Lisa, we asked you to come on to specifically talk about an event that happens every year in Washington, D.C. This year it happened from January 16th to 18th called ShmooCon. Can, can you explain to me what ShmooCon is? ShmooCon is an awesome conference. It feels to me like it started out as a hacker conference, and to some extent it's growing up a bit. So it is in Washington, D.C., as you mentioned, and being inside the Beltline, there are a lot of folks there that are focused on security considerations, but also on policy and some of the broader pictures beyond just, can we crack this thing that we're playing with this week? Which is not to say that there aren't still great hacker talks, but it's expanded to include defense as well as offense. So for example, when I started attending in 2007, the tracks were build it, break it, and bring it on, if I remember correctly. And they've added a belay it track to talk about defensive strategies and tools. All right. So one of... Go on. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just about to say that one of the uh, the interesting features of ShmooCon, uh, compared to some of the other security conferences that I go to every year, like DEF CON and Black Hat, is that we're, why, uh, where DEF CON is still kind of Wild West. It's everyone bring everything and break everything. Hack all the things which I love, by the way, and Black Hat is more of a, these are security experts and, and these are the things that they found. ShmooCon always had the sense of, okay, this is what we found, and in the real world, how are we going to defend ourselves against this? And, and that's that's the vibe I picked up from ShmooCon. It's definitely a little of both, and there's a wide variety of activities that go on around the talks. LobbyCon, so one of the uh, key features of ShmooCon is that tickets are often made of unobtainium. 
It's capped around 1,600 people by the Shmoo group that organizes the conference, and they do three rounds of ticket sales. And if you are not lightning fast on the F5 key when the ticket sales go up, they sell out in literally three to six seconds when the, the three rounds of ticket sales go out. Wow. So there's a lot of folks who don't necessarily get a ticket on the first try and may not get a ticket at all, but show up for LobbyCon and for some, you know, some of the activities that happen around ShmooCon, like the ShmooCon epilogues that happen the next day. But even within the conference, in addition to the uh, keynotes and the actual tracks, there is a lockpick village, which is often run by Tool, which is where I learned to pick locks. There's always capture the flag. There's usually a crypto challenge by G Mark or one of his successors. So there's a huge variety of different activities that go on within the conference as opportunities to practice and to collaborate. The infrastructure, ShmooCon Labs, reminds me actually a lot of the Interop Knock. A bunch of people come together and build a network that stands up for the weekend to whatever everybody decides to throw at it. And there are protected, you know, dot one X SSIDs, but there's also an open SSID where you're on your own in there. My TD was laughing a little bit when you started talking about tool because I, I brought back a set of tool tools from DEF CON this year and uh, he he had a blast learning how to pick locks. Yeah, go figure. Excellent. It's all about per sec. Uh, talking about this conference specifically, what what were some of the tracks that you found interesting or that you found very germane to what's happening right now? So this year there were some terrific talks. Um, the keynote was Joseph Lorenzo Hall with the Center for Democracy and Technology, and he was talking about tech policy. And tech policy is that elephant in the room that those of us who just like to play with toys and break things would really like to ignore. And the problem is that if we don't pay any attention to it, it's going to pay attention to us anyway. So he really gave a good overview of some of the current technical issues where policy is being shaped and talked a little bit at the end also about what people can do to influence policy. One of his key points was to get out into the community and sort of counteract this, you know, black hat hacker in a hoodie with a ski mask impression that the mainstream media tries to give every time somebody like Anthem gets popped to say, you know, really, we do a lot more than that. Hacker spaces contribute to the community. Hackers contribute tools for defense as well as offense. A lot of the tools like Metasploit, they're offensive tools, but one of their primary uses is for penetration testing and for white hat hacking. So that was a great keynote talk. Uh, a couple other really good ones that I enjoyed. Whitney Merrill, who's a graduate student at UC, she gave a talk on called Where the Wild Things Are, Encryption and law enforcement and users and what police can and can't access when they can ask you to decrypt things, what, what kind of access they have to encrypted data on phones, et cetera. Uh, another good one was the misfortune cookies. So a couple of guys from Checkpoint were attacking the control protocol that's used to control CPE or customer premise equipment. And so your cable modem, your uh, router in your home may be vulnerable to some pretty basic attacks, not because the protocol itself is necessarily insecure in its current version, but because so many of these devices are running four or five revs back with known security bugs and don't get updated. Another good one was two guys from Netflix, Scott and Andy, did a great talk on security automation, and they actually open sourced a bunch of tools that they use within Netflix. So if you've heard of Chaos Monkey, that type of uh, infrastructure defense, that's a good, all of these also, by the way, are on archive.org. So Ted does a fantastic job of recording all of the main talks. And then Adrian does a great job of recording the fire talk. So you can find the fire talks off of the Iron Geek archive. And you can find all of the ShmooCon talks, I think, going back to the beginning on archive.org. Right, right. Uh, Lisa, you, you did bring up uh, an interesting part uh, when, when you mentioned the, uh, the breach over to Anthem. Uh, about this this field, about uh, talking about security, specifically that whenever we have a big breach, be it Anthem or Sony or Target or TJ Maxx, just go right down the line. There's there's always two opposing forces that happen. There's first there's the knee jerk reaction of well we need to get on this, we need to spend millions and billions and whatever we need to do on security, and we need to get all these experts up. And then there's always this backlash, and I see it every single time against security researchers. Uh, which I've never really been able to reconcile. It's sort of, like, wait a minute, if these are the people who are telling you where you're vulnerable, 
Why do you always want to group them in with the people who are attacking you? Do, do you see that a, a, a bit? Because you've got a much better view over this field than I. Absolutely. So one of the panels I always enjoy at ShmooCon is the Ask the EFF panel. And in this year's Ask the EFF with Kurt and Nate, we had a big conversation about the Obama cybersecurity proposals. And one of the things included in that proposal would really criminalize security research. And it's ridiculous. It, I think it speaks to people acting out of fear and not understanding the value of this research. There's a huge difference between someone who's trying to compromise a system so that they can then sell their exploit to the Russian mafia versus someone who's trying to compromise a system so they can inform the provider of that system and help improve the security of that system. And unfortunately, the law doesn't necessarily recognize the difference. This is where tech policy becomes such a big issue. Right. There was also a, a closing plenary this year. They got together a bunch of um, security emeriti, people with you know, 20, 30 years in the business, and said, what can we do to really, you know, are we really making a difference here? All of these conferences, all the conversations we have, we keep having these hacks. Up, and the, the fact that an organization like Anthem can have what I call an M&M security model, where it's a hard, crunchy exterior <laughs> and it just melts in the middle, this is what century now, you know? So why why are we even still talking about this stuff if it's not having an effect? And that's one of the big questions that I think the security community is asking ourselves. Are we making a difference? I think security researchers are on the front lines of making that difference personally. Lisa, I, I do want to talk about that m and model, specifically about something that's been happening in the last three, four years, and that's BYOD, how that has completely invalidated the m and or the perimeter security model. Uh, when we come back, let's talk about BYOD. We'll bring Cheaper back in and get uh, just deep in to what you need to protect yourself. But before we do that, let's go ahead and take a moment to thank the third sponsor of today's episode, and that's LD Products. Now, let's, let's face it, folks. You're going to need paper. We live in a paper world. That means paper, toner, and ink. It's the lifeblood of the modern office. No matter how electronic we get, no matter how much data we keep in digital form, if you don't have paper, well, then you just don't have a business. Some things just need to be in front of you. It's a fact of modern life, even in this electronic area. So in today's paperless office, you've got two choices. You can pay a lot for your printing supplies and be confused when you buy them because you never really know if you're getting the right supplies for your printers or you could go to ldproducts.com. Uh, you don't go to the car dealership to buy gas, so why are you still going back to your printer manufacturer to buy ink and toner? LD Products offers a quality alternative at a fraction of the cost. Some products are up to 75% off of OEM. They've been in business for 15 years, since 1999, and they're a biz rate customer certified and a Google trusted store, shipping over 1 million orders a year. And they get that you're not an ink or toner expert. They don't expect you to know exactly what you want. That's why they have real people who are experts and who will treat you with respect seven days a week from their U.S.-based call center. Are you worried about getting the wrong product? I mean, I do, but don't. All their products are risk-free with a two-year, 100% customer satisfaction guarantee. That means you can return a product for any reason. But LD isn't just about good prices, great service, and an excellent return policy. It's quite a bit more. You see, buying LD brand cartridges helps you save the environment by keeping oil, plastics, and waste out of the landfills. That's, that's recycling, reusing 101. Plus, their call center, warehouse, and headquarters operate from a 110,000-square-foot platinum LEED-certified building in Long Beach, California. LD Products has your printer needs covered, remanufactured, compatible, and brand name products all in one place. To get 10% off ink and toner, plus free shipping, excluding OEM, go to ldproducts.com slash twit. That's ldproducts.com slash twit and enter the offer code twit. And we thank LD Products for their support of this week in Enterprise Tech. Let's get back into it. Uh, Chibert. Lisa just mentioned the M&M &M model, which I love. That's the whole crunchy outside and soft on the inside. We've, we've been preaching this, this uh, to this choir for a long time, right? The, the death of perimeter security. Oh, you betcha. You know, I've been a Mr. Zone for a long time. Don't just test from the outside, test from the inside. And oh my God, please test. Yeah, actually, yeah. It, it, if you're not going to test from the inside, at least test from the outside, test at one spot, 
be a little bit responsible. But Lisa, I I'd like to get your view because this is this is what your company does, by the way. Uh, actually, let's take some time here. Could you explain exactly what Pulse Secure does? Certainly. So Pulse Secure is a company that was just formed back in October. And we are the combination of the Pulse suite of products from Juniper Networks, which actually goes back to a Neo Terrace pedi uh, pedigree with the SSL VPN. And then the NAC products that grew out of the Neo Terrace SSL VPN within NetScreen and then within Juniper. Those products were combined with an acquisition of a company called Mobile Spaces, which has a BYOD container. So our focus is really secure mobility for the 21st century. Right. So, I mean, if you're if you're interested in secure mobility, that that's your DNA. That's what you do, which is why we've brought you on to talk about BYOD. Now, bring your own device has been a phenomenon. Uh, let's let's be honest. It really started with the iPad. Uh, there were laptops beforehand, but that's when you had a flood of devices that were being used both at the home and in the office. And you had IT people who had to start poking holes in their security to allow for those devices to have any sort of use on a corporate enterprise class network. What are some of the biggest problems you've seen in the BYOD era? I am the biggest problem I've seen <laughs> in the BYOD era. The first thing I do when I get a new Android phone is I root it. There we go, okay. My rooted Android phone is the perimeter of Pulse Secure's network. <laughs> I travel 80%. So I would say that the vast majority of the email that I send and the work that I do that doesn't involve actually generating a document is done on a phone or a tablet. So I've really seen things come full circle over, let's say, the last 12 years. And we started out with NetScreen acquiring Neoterrace. Mobile security meant using an IPsec client and then, thank God, an SSL VPN client on your laptop to get in. You know, if you carried a pager and you needed to connect in at 2 a.m. or if it snowed and you needed to work from home. And mobile security has really evolved from basically carryable desktop OSs to these things that we all hold in our hands and have glued to the sides of our heads. So we went through this period of trying to bring them into the enterprise and applying all sorts of admission control to try to make the enterprise a safe space. And that took some time. There were some bumps in the road. NAC was a little more complicated than everybody expected. And now what I'm seeing is we're actually moving back to the SSL VPN model as companies are moving more and more to cloud resources. So today, you know, for a small to medium enterprise, Pulse Secure is around 300 people. We don't have our own Exchange server. We use Office 365. We use SharePoint in the cloud. So I don't necessarily need to bring my own device into a Pulse Secure corporate network more than three or four times a year. Primarily, what I need to do is reach into the amorphous blob that has become Pulse Secure from Yammer to NetSuite to Office 365 from my phone, from my tablet, from my laptop. So we're seeing more and more focus on connecting from anywhere, from any device. We're seeing a lot of applications that are also changing as a result. So the applications are becoming web apps and I believe, or getting a web front end. And I believe that's one of the big overlooked aspects of BYOD security is yes, we need to be concerned about the devices. We don't have the level of control over them that we did over the desktop operating systems. But we also need to be concerned about this flood of new web applications that are catering to these mobile devices that have their own set of security risks. Actually, that's that's a fascinating way to approach it, that the, the challenge of BYOD isn't the device, which we would think. It's the services on those devices. That that absolutely makes sense. I mean, that's that's what you're actually bringing into your network when you SSL in. That's what you're actually bringing into your network when you bring your laptop in and plug it into a corporate network and expect to have free range of everything on that network. Chibert, let me ask you about that. What you Again, you're on a university campus, so you see pretty much everything, the best and the worst of networking. You see some incredibly bad habits, both from students and from researchers, do, do you see this? Do you see that the services that they run and that they want to have running on their devices the, as the reason why perimeter security no longer works at all? Actually, it's, I can badger, you know, we can badger around the faculty and staff and students. It's our administrators that are the problems. Oh, I don't have to do that. I sign your paycheck. 
Um, I've done a lot of private consulting, and it's the biggest breaches, the biggest problems with BYOD isn't the day-to-day -day worker. It's the administrators, the management that think they should have an exception. And I think there needs to be a change in the atmosphere, shall we say, of the executive suite that security has to be maybe not job one, but at least job two. And there can't be all these big exceptions. You have to design for a secure environment and stop making all these exceptions. And for God's sakes, quit letting your kid come into your office and plug in behind the firewall because I'm sorry, the kid's probably got an infected laptop. Uh, that's a big problem. All right. Lisa, if I were to ask you that the scenario that we always use is we have a 10,000 seat enterprise class network. Uh, you know, which is a little bit on the large side. And there's an IT manager, an IT worker, who is looking at changing policy or suggesting a change in policy that would make sense so that he could have his employees use devices both inside the network and from remote without compromising the kind of security that they want. Uh, we here at TWIT, we use the model TNO. It's uh, given to us by Steve Gibson. Trust no one. How do we move more to a model of that, like that using what we have as far as BYOD security is concerned? I think visibility is a key overlooked point in this transition from only corporate owned and controlled devices to mobile devices. It's realistically impossible to have 100% admission control in most enterprises. And I think that a lot of time and energy has been spent on that impossible goal. I would rather have as close to 100% visibility as possible. And then the ability to respond easily to anomalies in the network without having to worry about the day-to-day -day standard operations. So I would approach that as it's really handy to be able to look at what you can deliver through a mobile environment that is connected over a secure tunnel, something like a VPN on demand off the mobile phone, and especially if you can put a fence around that on the device itself. So the, for example, containerization, I think is really one of the areas of the future of BYOD because you can say to the user, you can run whatever app you want to on the personal side of your phone. We're gonna give you a workspace that is encrypted on the device. So you have protection for data at rest. It has VPN back to whatever resources, whether the corporate network directly or the cloud resources. So you've got protection for data in transit. You have control over what applications are gonna run in that workspace. And we're gonna really make a protected sandbox on your device so that you can protect that data while not being restricted in what you can do. If you wanna watch cat videos or take selfies. And the other benefit there is that users are gonna watch cat videos and take selfies anyway. And if you say, you have to give us the permission to wipe your whole phone if we don't like what you're doing. There's a lot of, especially millennials, for whom that's just no longer acceptable. So I think in these sort of not quite really large enterprises, but 10,000 seat is a pretty considerable size, you need to really consider where to apply what type of enforcement and where you just need visibility into what's going on. Maybe you want to allow guest devices or personal devices into your network, but very carefully protect the resources you don't want them to access. Maybe if you're something like a financial institution or a hospital, you do want to do some level of admission control. You have to be this tall to ride this ride. Right. There are different approaches depending on what, what type of regulations you have to comply with and what type of data you want to protect. Chibert, how does the sandboxing mesh with your, uh, your zone security idea? It's all of the above. You know, you... You can't have your sandbox open, you know, without any kind of control. So you're going to zone it if you're going to be running sandboxing, no matter what. Uh, one of the approaches I'm taking is we're taking a really hard look at VDI. In fact, I'm chatting with Reverse Delta in the chat room right now, talking about Citrix and things like that. Uh, VDI is one of the things that I'm taking a really hard look at of being able to provide remote access to data and resources to my researchers, but in a container of some sort so that 
in theory, if they're running it from an infected laptop or they're running it from home or they're running it from China, uh, I've got less attack surface, shall we say, less ways, less vectors for people to infect my network, but still provide additional services. So I think VDI has got a lot of growing up, especially in the authentication uh, arena. And that's why I'm really interested in how other people are doing BYOD because it's not going to be one magic bullet. It's going to be a lot of different things that you need to do together as the industry grows up. Lisa, I, I, we don't have enough time to go in depth into uh, Pulse Secure's solution. Uh, so I will invite you back so we can have a full episode just on, on how it works. But if you could, in the next couple of minutes, explain how I would use your company solution to give me that peace of mind. So create the sandbox, allow me to do what I need to do, and yet allow the uh, the IT folk and the security folk back in the enterprise to control what's actually coming into and out of their network. Absolutely. Again, I'm the poster child for this. I access resources within Pulse Secure from a workspace on my phone that is VPN on demand so that when I'm in the workspace or I'm using applications that are protected, the VPN is up. Inside the enterprise, we have intelligent firewalls that are gone beyond the standard stateful inspection and are doing identity-based access control. So you can take my authentication and also the authorization, which is the other half of that coin, and you can leverage that when I make my connection to the SSL VPN to also authorize me through a network segmentation firewall. If I do come into the office and I connect with 802.1x, again, that authentication can be federated out into different parts of the environment. And even if I'm coming in through SSL VPN and then also going to software as a service, some kind of cloud service, we can use SAML to do a single sign on to the cloud service. So what your enterprise can do is really offer a range of access control, but make it as transparent as possible. If I had to type a password 53 times a day, I would do a lot less from airports and hotels because it wouldn't be worth it to me. But the fact that I can pick up the phone, open up the workspace and immediately be doing 15 minutes of work for the, a delayed flight really makes me more productive. I like it. Chibert, is there anything else that you want to add on to this discussion about BYOD? I, I know this was a, incredibly cursory. This came after the, uh, at the end of a, a Shmoocon segment. So what, what do you want to send the audience off with? Actually, what I'd like everybody to start thinking about is not only things like multi-factor authentication, but start talk, thinking federated authentication. How do you set up pr trust relationships between multiple organizations? I think that is the holy grail um, that I'm reaching for. I'm currently standing up a VDI project for Kapiolani Community College, and the uh, getting VDI running wasn't hard. No, not hard at all. Uh, Citrix does a very nice job of that. However, getting the authentication pieces, especially when you want to have a pool of local users and then authenticate against the second pool like an LDAP. Very, very difficult to do. Not enough tools out there, not enough documentation. And the unfortunate thing is a lot of engineers think, oh, you know, so what if you've got to touch 100 different knobs to get it to work? That's fine. No, it's not. Because when you start making lots and lots of knobs, you make lots and lots of people going, scratching their hands going, is, am I supposed to put it on five or one or something like that? There's too much complexity and too many assumptions that the people configuring your systems are subject matter experts. So I throw that out. Complain and talk to your vendors and say, hey, this isn't good enough. We have a path. Help us down that path. And Lisa, last words to you about either your solution from Pulse Secure or what people should take from ShmooCon about BYOD or just about BYOD in general. I have a little bit of both. One of the things I love about ShmooCon is the feedback mechanism. They actually hand out Nerf balls and encourage them to be thrown at the presenter if you disagree. And I would say, <laughs> give that kind of feedback to your organization. If you want to be able to use a BYOD device, there are ways to do that that allow federated identity, that allow data security, but feedback from the user is actually really important in building a workable BYOD solution. 
Well, ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. You have used up another hour listening to the best dang enterprise podcast in the universe. That's according to nine out of ten Nerf balls thrown at presenters. I, I want to thank I want to thank my panelists for being out here and making this show possible. Uh, first, of course, to Lisa. Lisa, uh, again, this is your time. Talk anything about your company, about you, where they can find you on the internet, where they can find you on Twitter, where they can find your products, your services, or your work. Okay. Well, my company is Pulse Secure. We will be at RSA San Francisco, and I would also encourage folks to come to the Trusted Computing Group's pre-conference workshop at RSA. You can find me on Twitter at L. Lorenzen. I, it is not a corporate account by any means. About half of it is profanity and the rest of it is bitching about travel. But if you're into that kind of thing, look me up. <laughs> Fantastic. And Cheever, what have you been working on the last couple of days? I have been going crazy trying to get Active Directory and Open LDAP authentication with Federation working on Citrix VDI, um, pulling a lot of hair out. Uh, very, very frustrating that even with all the wizards and so forth, it's still way, way too complicated. Brian Chi, the director of the Advanced Network Computing Laboratory in Honolulu, Hawaii, and Lisa Lorenzen, the principal solutions architect from Pulse Secure. We thank you for being on the show, and uh, Lisa, we'll have you on again, but until then, good night. Look forward to it. All right, folks, this is the end of the show, but uh, don't be sad. In fact, we got a little something something for you, a little parting gift, and that is a place to get all of our episodes, our show notes, and a subscription link. Just go to the Twiat show page at twit.tv slash twiat. There you will find links for all of our episodes in case there was something that you missed. You can download it to your device of choice. Speaking of downloading, use that little RSS dropdown, and you'll have our episodes dropped into your device of choice each and every single week. Do you want an audio version in your iPhone so you can listen to us in the car? Or maybe a low-resolution video on your tablet or your large phone so you could watch us on break? Or maybe you want the super high-definition version so that you can catch all the enterprise goodness you can with a loved one on a couch in front of your big-screen TV. We make it possible, well, because we love you. Also, please, please go ahead and subscribe to me. Follow me on Twitter. Just go to twitter.com slash PadreSJ. That's at PadreSJ. If you go there, you'll find out what I'm doing each week when I'm not on Twit TV, and you'll also find out what our topics will be for all the shows I host on the Twit TV network. That one was kind of creepy. Uh, th this is the best way to find out how I spend my time. I don't know why I did that one, <laughs> but, but I should probably change that. But yes, just go to twitter.com slash podjsj. Also, we do this show live. Now, right now, we're doing it on at 2.30 p.m. Pacific time, on Mondays. But starting in March, we're going to be moving to 1 o'clock p.m. Pacific time on Friday. So make sure you update your schedules. Uh, if you're going to watch us live at live.twit.tv, where you can see the, the outtakes, the, the intro, the outro, the pre-show, the post-show, pretty much everything that goes in between, how the sausage is made, as they say, you may as well drop into our chat room at IRC. Dot twit dot TV. It's filled with some just incredibly brilliant folk, some very bright engineers, and just, just the best of the best of the Twit TV army. Also, I want to thank everyone here at the Brick House who makes this show possible, to Lisa and Lisa, uh, Leo, of course, for letting me do this show, to Carson, my super producer, and to the man with the plan, the person who I couldn't do this show without because he pushes all my buttons. Mr. Me? Brian Burnett, the cranky hippo. <laughs> Brian. I was hoping it was going to be me. It was I wasn't you. sure who I was going to throw to otherwise. I was going to do Turbs, but you know, whatever. Oh, yeah. Speaking of Turbs, I was going to say you can follow me at cranky oh. underscore hippo, and then uh, you'll see all me and Padre shenanigans. It's usually a, a back and forth of corgi pictures. So We we do a lot of dogs. I'm not sure that's why. That's not the that's only always... thing we do, though. No, yeah. Like, like quadcopters. We do quadcopters. Networks. And networks. And things. And you can watch me uh, mess up my network cables when I'm doing know-how with uh, Padre on uh, Thursdays at 11 o'clock Pacific time. So uh, check that out if you got the time. Back to you, Padre. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for watching. I'm Father Robert Ballas there, the digital Jesuit, reminding you that if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet.